Next question is from Pat of Blanc. Why do most calories and macro calculators still use the old school one gram per pound of body weight and even above 1.2 grams while cutting when most recent studies show no benefits for muscle building or fat loss in going above 0.7 grams per pound? Okay, it is true that studies show that you don't derive any extra muscle building benefits from eating more than around 0.7 grams of protein per body weight. However- Is it per body weight or is it per, per kilogram of muscle? No, 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 no. It's per pound of body weight. When they use kilogram, then it's a different uh, It's a different. See, number. I feel like that's the, the metric that uses 0.7 to 0.8 is when they're talking about kilograms. No, that's the old, uh, that's the old crappy one. This is, these are studies that show high protein at, you know, builds muscle. Because I know Lane like shared that. a study a while back that there there's some there's some benefits to the upper limits of one, up to 1.5. Well, here's where the benefits, I think, most of them come from. Because there's a lot of studies that have been done on this, okay? And yeah, you can find the outlier studies, but the vast majority of them, the consensus is roughly 0.7 grams of protein per pound of body weight, anything more than that, and you don't derive any more muscle building benefits. Does that mean you're not going to get any more benefits? Not necessarily, because here's something that protein provides. By the way, it has to be appropriate for you. What I mean by that is some people eat too much protein, and it messes up their digestion. If that's you, don't go in this direction, okay? Mm -hmm. that, that will make your gains. Bad digestion will mess you up more than anything else. But if you're cool with it, eating more protein has this benefit right here. You might not build more muscle, but boy, is it an appetite suppressant. Out of all the macronutrients, mm -hmm. protein is very, very satisfying. So if you're trying to drop body fat, it helps a lot to eat a lot of protein. You're less likely to overeat. I also think it's really tough, you know, for most people, unless you weigh a buck fifteen, it's really tough to hit a one to one. And so if you're targeting one or one point five or probably 1 .2, fall short, but you'll be exactly good. some days you're gonna fall short and you're gonna be just fine. And or maybe even days you go way lower, 0. 0.6, but then the next day you hit one point two or one point five mm -hmm. and it all because it's so funny. We we look at everything in these like small control groups and studies and and the day is twenty four hours. Like the body doesn't work that way. It doesn't know the difference of day 20 or hour 25 or 29. It's like it's over the course of a, a longer period of time of that. So, and the reality is most people, most people, not bodybuilders, most average clients that I train under consume protein. So I always like to push them to one-to-one. -one. I always, even yeah. though I know that 0.7 is, is all they need, I'm pushing them in the direction of one-to-one -one because I know that they're going to fall short some days. Yeah. It's, it's not easy. I mean, you know, I, as of the other day, I weighed about 211, 212 pounds. I don't eat 212 grams of protein a day. That's a lot. I eat probably 160 to 170 grams of protein, and that's me chasing protein. I mean, you know, 200. How many chicken breasts would be 200 grams of protein? Not to mention that I think there's a lot of benefit. And some days you actually hitting 250, and then another day you only hitting 50. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. So we we've talked about this before. I I think where this you get in trouble is you're hitting these numbers of you know, two gram one point above one point five to two, and you're a, and you're one of those guy competitors who is weighing it, measuring it every day, and consuming that or above, and you've now you've married this. The average person that's just kind of trying to figure out, like, oh, where should my protein mm -hmm. be? Targeting a number like where, one. Wasn't is fine. there like I, I think I remember back when a lot of these biohackers were trying to really press the fact that you know more than point seven, like you're going to get into like kind of uh, like cancerous uh, no. type of amount through the mTOR pathway and all this kind of stuff that they're proposing in terms of it being carcinogenic at a, at a certain point. Yeah, so it, it, when they start to make the cancer arguments, it's silly because in a pro-cancer environment, okay, so you're unhealthy. Yeah, yeah, pro-cancer, you can make the case for every macronutrient yes. being unhealthy. If you're, if you're, uh, yeah. you're inflamed, you have- This was big for a while. Pre-cancer cells going on, you're, you're not healthy, um, and then you have a tumor- that's growing in your body and you eat a lot of protein or a lot of carbs, you're going to fuel it. You're going to fuel or the growth of, of it. Yeah. You're going to fuel the growth of the cancer. Less so fat, but yeah, not even, even fat. Now, if you're healthy, uh, then you're fine. You're totally fine. You're not going to be fueling that just, okay, look, how about, how about this? Uh, estrogen, testosterone, right? Male and female hormones in a pro cancer environment, depending on the cancer, both of those hormones can fuel cancer, right? So if you have high testosterone, and you have prostate cancer, one of the ways they prevent the cancer from growing is to block your testosterone. If you have breast cancer, they'll put you on uh, drugs that block the effects of estrogen. Does that mean estrogen and testosterone are cancer-producing hormones or they're, they're pro-cancer? No. Mm -hmm. But in the context of cancer, 
Lots of things then become uh, you know drivers of cancer. Protein uh, being one of them, but so is carbs. So is pretty, you know, pretty much well, anything else. So, which is why they've I think didn't they accept fasting is now a protocol. Right? Yeah. Isn't yeah. fasting now a protocol for cancer? It is. And uh, um, there's, there was that one study that was done that showed that people who fasted before doing yeah, chemo- In conjunction with chemo. Yeah, right? killed way more cancer yeah. cells and protected more uh, of the healthy cells. Um, so, you know, fasting's got some interesting uh, implications for, uh, or applications, I should say, for uh, for cancer. You know, that you know in Chinese medicine, fasting was one of the ways they treated cancer mm -hmm. Bef you know, for thousands of years. They, they saw a tumor- They'd have the person starve. I mean, obviously, you're starving the, the tumor as well. So right. anyway.